Okay, fantastic. Lovely to see you all. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I think we're just waiting for a couple more people before we begin. Um, but just while we're waiting for them to come in, I'll start with a few housekeeping notes. So just so you know that this session is being recorded, um, don't worry, you're not going to be on the recording because you're all attendees in this webinar, but you can view it after, um, or if you like, you can spread the word so that others can see it and it will be on YouTube and Facebook Live recorded after. And throughout our talk today, please feel free to send over any questions to me in our Q&A function and I'll be leading our Q&A session in the last 20 minutes or so of our event. So whenever you feel inspired today throughout our talk, please feel free to send in any questions. So soon we'll be going live on Facebook. And we'll let you know just in a minute or so when we're beginning. And while I have you, just before we begin, just so you know, after today's event, you'll be directed to a super quick survey. It's only two minutes or so. Um, so we'd be really pleased if you could fill that out for us just, uh, just after the event's finished, it'll pop up on your screen. Lovely to see you, everyone. Hi, Joe. Hi, James. Susan. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. So I think we're just preparing to go live now. Throughout today's events, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to put them in our Q&A. And I will bring them into our Q&A session at the end. Okay, fantastic. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of Saltar Society Edinburgh Branch Online Conversations. Um, we're really glad to have you. And now I'll hand over to John Yellow Lees, convener of the Edinburgh Branch, to introduce our guest for today. So John, over to you. Thank you, Carrie. I hope you can hear me. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon and welcome everyone to what is the third of our uh, Edinburgh branch conversations or webinars and today it is for me a very great honour to be able to introduce someone I first met about 40 years ago would it be Irene mm -hmm. when Irene's husband Gordon persuaded me to join the Scots Language Society. I'm afraid I quickly discovered I was a towny fake whereas Irene is the rural real thing. Um, <laughs> I won't call you Gallus Bism because I'm not sure if that's an insult or not. I never got that far. But I know that Irene um, is the rural real thing because she was from a, from a farming family and she still stays on the family farm near Kinross. Her teaching career has always included teaching in speech and drama, including in Scots. And she has been secretary of the Scots Language Society and is a member of the Edinburgh branch of the Saltire Society. And today she is being ably assisted by her daughter Is Ishmael, who I must remember to say is an actor, not an actress. And Ishmael's entire acting career has shown great commitment to the Scots language, including productions like Always for Howlett and an on-train production, which for me proved a certainly un an unforgettable experience. So it's my pleasure to hand over to Irene, <laughs> assisted by Ishmael, to tell us about how to publish children's books in Scots. Well, thank you very much for your kind words, John. And um, I'll consider the um, Gallus Bism um, description and uh, come back to you on that later. Um, now, I, I, if you'd noticed, John has mentioned it's children's books in Scots that I'm going to be speaking about today rather than just generally publishing books in Scots, because that is where my experience lies. Um, I'll speak for round about 40 minutes, and then at the end, after I finish the, the talk, I will then read my copy of The Nest Before Christmas, which is the, the book that I have recently had published. Um, I know it's not quite Christmas time, but uh, 
Um, and I'm sure you can all remember what Christmas was, uh, what was Christmas felt like last year. So um, I have, as John says, been in so Scots speaker really all my life um, on the farm. I uh, was quite used to farming words in Scots, um, Scots vocabulary, Scots grammar. So it was just a second, second nature really. Um, not at school, generally, um, people of my generation did not get much in the way of Scots language or literature at school and at Dollar Academy, that was certainly the case. After I left university, I joined the Scots Language Society. And one of our members, or one of the committee members at the time, was a Dr. George Philp, um, based in Glasgow. Now, George founded a company called Scotsoon, and what they did was they produced little, at that time, cassette tapes of readings um, of Scots literature, Scots poetry, uh, Scots prose, um, both from the past and from the present. And in 1977, um, they produced um, a cassette of readings of the Perth poet William Souter. And as part of that, uh, George presented to the Perth Festival, which was which is now known as Perform in Perth, um, a trophy, which um, it was called the Souter Tassie. And that, um, as, knowing that I was a Perth teacher, he suggested that I uh, train some children to compete to win this trophy. Now, I'd never done anything like that and wouldn't have thought of doing it, but um, I tentatively entered seven children for the Souter Tassie competition. And one of my pupils, a boy called Scott Mitchell, who is now a very well-established uh, pianist, um, uh, well-known in Scotland and abroad. But at that time, he won the Souter Tassie. And that was my first year of doing it, uh, the Souter Tassie competition. And I have to confess that uh, this is now, I'm still entering children for the Souter Tassie. And that is, uh, this is my, I have to say, my 45th year of entering children for this competition. Now, if you look at the base of the trophy, if you can see it there and look to the year 1998, you will see the name Ishbel McFarlane. That was the centenary of Souter's birth. And that year, Ishbel was of an age that she was able to enter and she won the trophy that year. So I've always been very proud of that trophy. Now, John has... Um, uh, spoken about um, about Ishbel and Ishbel is very kindly doing the um, PowerPoint for us today. And Ishbel, you'll remember uh, from the talk on the, her show on the train that John was very kindly helped her and encouraged her to do that. Um, she's also written the play Always for Hulet, which she toured around Scotland, and. Um, uh, and was in the was in the fringe and then at, at toured elsewhere and that play you can buy um always for hulet <clears throat> now i thought i would um give you a sample of Souter tassi uh, competition from this year um an online festival this time obviously anything like that had to be done has to had to be done online and uh, we've got one of my pupils here a little boy called tom doing the poem crusts of Kindness by William Souter. So you're now going to hear Tom, or see Tom, doing Crusts of Kindness. Crusts of Kindness. Where the Highgate ends at the waterside, you'll see an old man stand. The sea moths are whippering round his head and snip the bread from his hand. Fair day or wheat, you will find him there. At the self same oar and place, the white wings flick to the root of the air, and a fain look on his face. And the thoch that comes home as you wash him stand, so raggedy, old and fail, that the cross of kindness he holds in his hand, and all he is kin himself. Oh, thank you. Tom for that in absence from the online per perform in Perth this year. It's still going on um, this competition every year. Um, now Tom you can see is not uh, doesn't have a, a Scots speaking background but 
I'm keen that people in Scotland should be able to recognise and understand and use Scots. After all, in the last census, uh, 1.5 million people stated that they were Scots speakers. Now, I decided that having been teaching Scots for all these years. I also do lots of recitations myself. I can do your rare Tam O'Shanter if you want one. And I also sing Scots songs as well. And I thought, well, why not have a go at doing a book? Now, I'm a sort of a mad keen on Christmas person. So I thought, right, a Christmas, Christmas book would be a good idea. It's also um, maybe more popular, uh, you know, in the shops um, to, to buy Christmas books. And my first thought was, to do the 12 days of Christmas. But then, sadly, a visit to Watterson's one day, I discovered that someone had already done it. And in fact, uh, this is this lovely version of the 12 days of Christmas by Susan Rennie. So I thought, right, can't do that, better find another one. So I then moved my thoughts to doing the night before Christmas. Um, now, the night before Christmas, you will know um, extremely well, I am absolutely certain. Um, it was written by Reverend Clement Clark Moore in the United States and published in, in 1843. Now, it's such a well-known um, story poem, this one. Um, every, in, every American Christmas movie that you'll see, you'll see somebody sitting with children, reading to them the night before Christmas. It's obviously very much part of their Christmas, American Christmas tradition. And uh, so we'll just give you a sample of the original here. It was the night before Christmas when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung in the chimney with care in hopes St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children, were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. So um, it's out of copyright, which is obviously a great advantage, um, keeps the cost down. And so I th thought, right, I translated it and I thought, right, um, I want to see if I can find myself a publisher. And I want it to be a, a publisher and an illustrator. I want it to be in Scots and in a Scottish setting. So um, this, uh, an illustrator, I knew an illustrator. So I thought, well, why not use the one that I know? And her name's Ro Rosemary Cunningham. Now I've known Rosie for a long time because Ishbel lived with her for a number of years before she got married. And I've seen the kind of work that Rosie does. She's a very, um, a very busy um, illustrator, Rosie. And I noticed a lots of her style of illustration would be really would really lend itself to um, to being a, a book illustration. What Rosie is probably best known for. Um, is the Glasgow alphabet, which you can see there, where she gives, uh, she illustrates different buildings in Glasgow for each letter of the alphabet. So I, I spoke to Rosie one day and she said, well, why not give it a try? So then I needed a publisher. And it <clears throat> just so happened that I had just recently been um, doing some proofreading for um, a book um, published by the Perth, um, Perth Publishing Company, uh, Tipper Muir Books, and it's called <clears throat> The Tale of the Wee Maudi. Now, it's, uh, or The Tale of the Wee Maudi, that wanted to ken wha kich drun is hid, and I'm sure you can guess what kich means if you have a look at the wee Maudi. It's a translation of um, a German story done by Matthew Mackey from Perth. So, um, Tipper Muir, um, has a wide, um, quite a wide range of books that they publish, many of them Perth with some sort of Perth connection. It's quite a small independent publisher, but their, their catalogue is growing constantly um, and it's a varied catalogue. So as well as the wee Maudi, they have other um, Scots books as well, that down bottom right there, Squatter of Bairn Rhymes by Stuart Patterson. These are all new poems for children. And then um, in a small room next to it, which is actually a recent publication by Tipper Muir of um, 
poems by Souter set to music. And so the music is, is available as well for that. There's two, two others, a recent one, a lovely one on the Black Watch and people's reminiscences about the Black Watch. And then in the left bottom left corner, um, If Rivers Could Sing, a wonderful book about a year and the natural history of the River Devon, where Gordon, my husband and I have had many a walk and discovered many little corners on the Devon during our lockdown year. So um, uh, one day at a um, book launch, I uh, happened accidentally, in inverted commas, to have a copy of my poem in my pocket. And I, Paul Philippou from Tip and Muir was there. So I brandished this before him and said, what would you think about publishing this? So uh, Paul said, well, let's just have a look and see what we can, um, what we can do with it. Um, now, there has been recently quite an explosion in um, publication of books for children in Scots, and particularly picture books, as you can see here. This is just a selection from Ishbel's um, bookshelves that she reads to her toddler. And um, compared with five years ago, I mean, there are far more now than there were then. And Scottish children's books come into a number of different categories. We could divide them into different categories. So first of all, we have um, books that are translations uh, with pre-existing pictures, so pre-existing picture books for children, where all you need to do is to change the text. And the, that's obviously the vast majority of them. And that's obviously the cheapest way to do it, where it's just the text that you're changing. The illustrations really are the kind of dearest part of, of a translation of a, of a book. So that's um, the Gruffalo of, is the most popular, I would think. Um, you could hardly meet a child that hasn't a copy of the Scots Gruffalo in the house somewhere. So it's been a it's been a rip roaring success, the Scots Gruffalo. Um, <clears throat> so next, I would you mentioned that the Gruffalo is available and you can see it's almost like a herd of Gruffalo there. Um, they're not all the same. They are actually different uh, versions of the Gruffalo in different, um, through different dialects. So you've got, uh, so, so different people have taken the Gruffalo story, seeing how successful it's been in Scots and said, right, we'll set it in a different part of Scotland. And well, just to give you a sample now of that, here we have from the English Gruffalo, a mouse took a stroll through the deep dark wood. A fox saw the mouse and the mouse looks good. And then in Doric, a moose took a dander, bend the wood. A Todd saw the moose and the moose look at good. And then in the standard Scots one, a moose took a donner through the deep murk wood. A Todd saw the moose and the moose look at good. And then the Glasgow version, actually translated into Scots by Elaine C. Smith, a gallus moose tain a donner through a scary big wood. A fox clopped the moose and the moose looked good. So um, that is, uh, that's the Gruffalo. And um, I think probably the dialect ones have been just as successful. The next category um, of Scots children's books would be um, books with uh, new uh, translations with new illustrations, and that would include obviously the Nicht of Four Christmas. Um, then our next category um, are children's adaptations of pre existing Scots text, and this is a lovely little one for wee ones or with um, uh, little snippets of popular poems and songs by Robert Burns um, with new illustrations. Um, Ishbel's little girl likes that one. Um, then we now have new adaptations with new illustrations. So obviously um, there's fewer of these. Um, this is a particularly lovely one, a real um, heirloom book, I think. 
um, of Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales translated into Scots um, by a number of writers, some of them very famous, like Elaine C. Smith again, Val McDermott is there, and that, that is a beautiful book. And it's published by Itchy Koo Books, and Itchy Koo, I think, would be really one of the forerunners of this current wave of translating and writing um, to new, new texts as well for children in Scots. They certainly have a, a very big catalogue there. Then um, the next category would be completely new text with illustration. And these are almost always would have to have some external funding. This one's called B is for Foggy Bummer. And it, the, here the illustrations are done um, by children from the Afford Primary School. Um, obviously there, there must be very enthusiastic teacher doing right up in the in Doric land up there. And that's, that's a lovely book. And, uh, and then finally in this uh, children's book section, um, you've got the ones that are books that are without illustration for older children. And the Harry Potter and Philosopher's Stone there, that's, a, that's a, quite a popular one to, for people to buy. And it's very accessible. And it, um, it uses the, the well-known front cover that everybody would recognize from the original Harry Potter book. So that's, uh, you've got there other ones like Treasure Island, Winnie the Pooh as well would, would come into that, into that category. So um, we, here we've got a list of some of the publishers who publish in Scots for children. There's Itchy Koo at the top, an all Scots sub-branch of black and white publishing. You've got the other, amongst the others, is Tipper Muir, of course. And then people can even, people even self-publish or have community publishing in, uh, of Scots texts for children. So this is a picture of a bookshop in um, Friesland, Northern Netherlands. Now, um, if you think of Frisian as being somewhat equivalent in its relationship to Dutch, as Scots is to English, this, um, they have really gone as far as they can, I think, or, or, or they've certainly gone a lot further than Scots in making these books available. Um, there are 400,000 Frisian speakers. We're supposed to have five and a, a million and a half in Scotland. And there they have bookshops of entirely Frisian books. And these shelves that you see in that picture, these are all, all of the books on these shelves are books for children. So I think we've still got quite a long way to go, even though we've, we have got, got quite a distance already with the business of, of um, producing books for children in Scots. Now, we have now move on to my own translation of The Night Before Christmas. So obviously, it is a translation of an existing poem, existing story poem. Uh, so I decided that I wanted this to be a book of, of high quality, a high quality product that could be handed down to other and passed on to other children, um, just as the Gruffalo is. But to have such a thing, the cost was going to be considerable. And uh, for example, paying an illustrator and, and Rosie in doing the illustration, it took her, took her weeks to do the illustration by um, all the different stages that there were in actually getting a finished product. So Tipper Muir suggested applying for a grant. And there is such a grant available. It's called the Scots Language Publication Award. And it's managed by the Scottish Book Trust but, and funded by the Scottish Government. We submitted an application in February for this. And we were told originally that we would hear uh, sometime in May that, needless to say, didn't happen with all that was going on last year. We didn't actually find out that we'd, um, whether we were successful or not until September. And fortunately, we were successful and we were awarded the maximum grant that was available for 
um, such a project, an individual project, and a grant of five and a half thousand pounds, which was brilliant. So having then been promised the money, it was then going to be a rush to get the book in the shops for the Christmas market, which really should have been by October. Shops like to have their Christmas books by then. Um, so poor old Rosie had to do the, um, the vast bulk of the illustrations after that. She'd done a few for the, um, the original application, but we'd been holding off until we found out if we were going to get the grant or not. Um, so when you submit such a grant, you have to explain what your, your concept is. And um, of course, the first thing I said was, well, we're going to set it in Scotland. Now, I didn't want the setting to be a cute country cottage, such as you find in lots of the English text versions of the next before Christmas. And I thought, well, why not set it in Glasgow, in a very recognisable Glasgow context, um, the context of being within a, in a flat, in a, in a tenement. And um, it just so happens that in Rosie Street, where, where she lives in Glasgow, in Garnet Hill, there is the, um, the National Trust for Scotland's Tenement House Museum. And I decided that that is where we were going to set this story. Um, I thought the link with the National Trust, I thought would be a useful one for publicity and also the National Trust properties have shops. Um, I imagine that being in, in all of the shops, but of course, 2020, uh, there was a real problem with that as their properties and the shops were closed. So hopefully this year um, we'll be able to get the book into the National Trust shops. The Tenement House uh, is actually, the Tenement House Museum is actually off to the right in that photograph. Um, and so Rosie set about um, producing or representing the uh, Tenement House um, terrace there. Now, we've actually, if you see the, 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 one, the building that we have used, we see the little man with the yellow windows, the first floor, that is the one that we have used uh, just for the, the point of view of the, the, the viewer looking at that illustration. Um, so we, it's not actually in the position that it would be in the real building. And um, so that's, there we have the outside of the, the tenement house um, property that we were going to use. And uh, we're now moving to the interior. So this to me was an ideal place to, to set this story. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you'll know, I'm sure you know the story of the, the Tenement House Museum. It was lived in by a lady who um, kept it really the same as it had been um, to, from all, for, uh, for many, many decades. And um, so it really is very much as it would have been in the early 20th century. And then after she died, subsequently things moved on and it came into the hands of the National Trust and is now uh, a wonderful museum of, li of life in Scotland as it was then. It also has, of course, that very important thing for, um, uh, for this story is a lum for Feather Yuletide, as I called him, Feather Yuletide to wheek up and doon in the, the night before Christmas. Um, so it's, but I didn't want it to be set sort of in the past. We would, um, it's not part of a, I wanted it to be a set in a modern Scotland with a, with a, a re reflecting a modern Scottish family who happened to live in that property. And uh, to understand that modern Scotland is a multicultural country. Um, and we decided to reflect that in the, the family. And this was all part of the application, part of the concept that we submitted when we applied for the grant. So we decided to have a West Indian, um, her Caribbean origin dad and a white um, origin um, mum. And um, so part of our research is for this um, and to sort of 
designing the room that this, that this was, go was going to be in the book, um, Rosie um, used this book, very useful book called The Front Room, which is um, basically shows the way in which um, uh, immigrant or migrant families coming into the country have used, have decorated their homes to reflect something of their, of their uh, home or their ancestors' heritage. And here we have what is an actual fact, um, an installation from an exhibition um, on this, um, based on round what this round this book by Michael Macmillan, and uh, this uh, you can see on the right hand side, and um, some you know as, as how it would be imagined to be a West Indian cultural home, and uh, for example, you have there the pineapple. Um, which was apparently a very popular thing to have in such a house. And that would have been used uh, there with, at the bar as an ice bucket. Um, and note also the standard lamp and the wallpaper. So Rosie decided to use these to influence her own design for the room within the book. So there you have your, the pineapple on the... Um, mantelpiece and you have the standard lamp and the wallpaper. So it's incorporating these things from the West Indian heritage to um, in, into a Scot very much Scottish context. And I think, you know, I think that she made a, a very good job of it. You'll notice there's a cat there. Now, I think every single home really has to have a cat. Um, so that's the inside, the interior of the house. And now, and, uh, now we have the family who live there. And there you see the West Indian heritage dad and the white heritage mum. And the children, these little, um, little sketches that Rosie did of the, um, of the children in bed, you can imagine they're, them there dreaming the, on the night before Christmas, dreaming of sugar plums, as sugar plums danced in their heads. Um, so we move now from the inside of the house to the visitors who came there on that Christmas Eve. And uh, the visitors were, of course, Father Yuletide himself and his reindeer in their sleigh. Um, so here we turn again to, to Rosie's idea that they would have a blend of different northern cultural influences for Feather Yuletide, for his sleigh and the reindeer. And if you, you can see there on the flanks of the, the reindeer on their sides and also on the sleigh, you have kind of, a sort of Celtic imagery. Um, and uh, the reindeer, you'll see the names of the reindeer um, beside these little shields. Um, and uh, they're all um, the characters, the characteristics of the reindeer's faces match the, the reindeer's names. Um, so, yeah, I think we're, <clears throat> this is, um, this building, that you see in the, on the cover of The Next Before Christmas is another well-known um, Glasgow building, not far from the tenement house. And it is the rather magnificent Charing Cross Mansions, which um, any Glasgow person would recognize. Um, it, we thought it was important to use real buildings, really, rather than, um, you know, rather than fantasy ones for the, for the, the bulk of the story. And there, uh, when Rosie did the illustrations originally, she, um, there was no snow on the roof of the, of the Channing Cross mansions. But of course, this winter very obligingly provided us with snow. So Rosie nipped along one day and took that photograph. So you can see the, um, you can see how, how realistic it is, how realistic her, her sketch is there for the, for the cover. Um, looking at the actual building, the Charing Cross Mansions, down in the bottom right, you see um, a shop. Now it's, um, 
it's a toy shop called Big Top, and um, the 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 shop, needless to say, has Rosie took copies of the book there, and it's been a great success. Um, understandably, that has a on the outside of the book is the very building that the shop is in. But there are a couple of little, just <clears throat> nice little stories of um, little um, interactions that there were with people who bought the book there. There was um, an elderly lady picked up a copy of the book, and she um, took it to the um, the assistant and to pay for it. And the assistant said to her, um, "Did you buy? Have you bought this for somebody? Is this for a grandchild?" Or and the old lady just kind of looked at her in the eye and said, "No, it's for myself." So, which I thought was a lovely little story because it just indicated that uh, you know she recognised. The, the places within the book as being perhaps similar to where she stayed and maybe she'd never had that opportunity before and perhaps too she recognized the language and understood the language of the translation there was another another incident of a little girl who um looked at the pictures in the book and she <clears throat> very excitedly uh, discussed with her mother who lived in all of the the different flats within the building. Now, very likely that was not actually her tenement terrace, but again, she saw that as somewhere that resembled where she stayed. Now, so you see there the, the um, Santa Feather Yuletide's sleigh. And so the influence, the influences that Rosie used for the um, for the sleigh, apart from the obviously uses the Celtic images there, but she also thought about the Uphelia uh, festival in uh, Shetland in January, where this Viking ship is um, is built for the for the festival for the fire festival and that seemed you know a very realistic and very um, um suitable um image to use for santa's sleigh for feather yuletide sleigh um the, you can see the you know the prow there um a teacher in one class i was speaking to uh, she was a shetlandic lady and she said that's exactly you know, that's exactly what it's like. So that was nice to, to know. Um, so once again, with the, the we, we get this uh, sense of, uh, and also in, in, the clo in the clothing of Feather Yuletide himself, we get these um, sort of cross between with Shetlandic, Celtic, North, Scottish folklore. You can see the, the decoration that Rosie has created for his uh, little bib on his tunic and then the, the um, braiding round his sleeves and round uh, the base of his tunic. And there you can see some of the images that, that Rosie um, used when she did her, her research. No, we, it was, although it's set in Glasgow, it's not just a Glasgow book. It, we, it's a book for children all over Scotland. And um, <clears throat> at, the, at the back of the, at the end of the story, she shows Feather Yuletide traveling all over Scotland from north to, to south, east and west. Um, and this is fun for the children to recognize and identify the different places. Anyone I've shown it to, they all know the Harry Potter train that is so famous now. And um, we used <clears throat> realistic places, real real places like um, obviously the Robert, Robert Burns's uh, cottage there and, and the Fourth Bridge. But then we also dipped into Scottish folklore, Scottish fantasy and the form of the Loch Ness Monster, who has a little peek out there to see the <coughs> feather yuletide and the sleigh flying over. And then the Kelpies, of course, very much part of Scottish, um, Scottish folklore. Um, so we come now really to um, thinking about the translation itself. And um, we decided really not to put a full glossary 
at the back because partly because it's um, it has illustrations so people can guess really what is being said because the illustrations are there also because the original story is so well known um the original poem is so well known that people can you know cross reference with the original poem um we ultimately did put a, a complete glossary which is available on the tipper muir website but as far as the book was concerned i decided that we would just concentrate on the the reindeer names um and uh, the reindeer names you can see um, the only two <clears throat> that really translate directly from the Moor poem would be Donner and, and Blitzen in that we have Lichten and Thunner. But the other ones, um, the, the words that I chose for the reindeer are not, um, are not the ones from the original poem, your Dasher, Dancer, Comet, etc. And um, so I had fun with that, really, cho choosing names that fit different Scottish characteristics. One of my absolute favorite Scots words is the one bottom left there is smedum. Um, <clears throat> Lewis Grassett Gibbon used that word a lot, but it means energy, resourcefulness, and true grit. And you can see smedum the reindeer looking there with, with, uh, with energy, resourcefulness, and a true grit. So the, the other um, piece of um, dictionary or, or Pictionary, really, that we we decided to use were what I called hoos words, and <clears throat> it was really partly because of the connection to the a particular building to the Tenement House Museum. So we chose some um, built environment words and uh, to to uh, to use as with uh, the actual illustrations there. Um, so we we used words that appear in my translation, but relate to different parts of the, the building, um, like Winnock, Ingle, Hinger, Flare, and um, Lum, Riggan, Roof, Waugh, etc. So uh, that's the only, um, that's fairly self-explanatory what these words mean. So we have a book, and um, by, by the early November, it was ready to go into the shops. Um, we have uh, subsequently, the publishers have had to do a reprint. They did have to do even before Christmas, after they sold the first thousand books, it was then reprinted. Um, we know that the copies of it have are now actually all over the world. We know of copies in Canada, Australia, Japan, Thailand, Brazil, New Zealand, and even, whisper, whisper, in England, I believe. Um, so we, what do I now do with it? Well, we um, obviously want to, to use it as an education, um, an educational aid. And um, that was also part of the application for the grant was that I would um, have contacts with schools and we would um, advertise um, the Scots language and make, make that better known <clears throat> to school children. So before Christmas, I did manage to get, speak to a few classes at Strathallan, where I still do a bit of teaching, got into a couple of classes there, had a bit on online with some children. But I'm hoping that next, that next Christmas or we'll actually be able to do a lot more I'm also going to prepare some uh, um, classroom activity materials for teachers to use. Um, if I don't actually get into the school, the Tippermuir website has a copy of a video of me reading the poem. Um, Strathallan last Christmas did a little bit of publicity for us and got something onto, onto their website. And there, the, the, the boy in the picture there is Eric. And Eric did a bit of reading from the poem. Now, Eric actually did this year win the William Souter Tassie at Perform in Perth last week. Um, he won it last year as well. An excellent, an, a Perth boy and an excellent reader of Scots. So that's it really, apart from saying, once again, before I read the poem uh, myself, I will um, 
thank Ishbel very much for doing all of that PowerPoint stuff. Um, if it had been up to me to do something like that, I tell you, this this could never have happened. But Ishbel um, has, you know, done a lot of work preparing all that material. So I will now read for you the actual The Nicht Before Christmas. Um, by Irene McFarlane, dedicated to Mariah, that's Ishbel's daughter, and Beatrix, who is Rosie, the illustrator's daughter. Twas the nicht afore Christmas, when all through the house, no a crater was steering, no e'en a moose. The moggins was hung in the engel with care, in hopes Feather Yuletide sin would be there. <clears throat> the bairnies all been lay asleep in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And ma, fair for fochen, Marcel reached this jasket, a lang winter's nap was all that would ask it. When out on the girths, there come sick a steer, a lout fi my bed to see what was the beer. A wat the winnock, a skirred o'er the flare. I opened the hingers. Oh, what could be there? A min on the breast o' the new fawn snow gied the skinkle o' twa oors to objects of law. When wit, to my winner and in sid appear, but a small book at slay. And echt tiny reindeer, we a recht we all driver, say birky and quick, a kent and a glisk, it mon be Saint Nick. Bear swippet nor eagles, his coursers they came, and he whippled and gullert and cried them by name, new birky, new murky, new plisky and winner, on ident, on smedum, on lechnan and thunner. To the top of the riggin, the top of the wall, new scalp a wall, scalp a wall, scalp a wall, aw. As dead leaves afore a muckle stoor shift, a bluffet will tack them right up to the lift. See up to the riggin, the coursers they fly, we a cat full of toys, and with Saint Nick forby. And then, in a blink, I heard on the rift. The winchin and potin or elk a wee hiff. As I drew in my head, it near cart me goup. Doon the lum, feather yuletide gam, we a loup. He was happit in fur, fe his head to his fit, and his clays was all clarty, we ashes and sit. A bundle of toys he had o'er his back, like an old gabber lunzy we a foo chapman's pack. His een, who they slink it, his dimples, oh, who merry, his chokes was like roses, his neb like a cherry, his wee moo, say pocky, was kinked like a boo, and his lang bussy beard was as white as the snow. The stump o' a cutty, had it ticked in his teeth, and the smeek floated o'er in his head like a wreath. He had a braid face and a wee roon belly that shook when he locked like a bowly o' jelly. He was sonsy and chuffy, a recht canty old elf, and I locked when I glissed him in spite of myself. A blink o' his ee and a twist o' his head, Sin let me to lose, I had naething to dread. He spak nae a word, gade, but gade stroch to his work. He stap at the moggins, then biddled wi a jerk. He nodded his head, touched his neb at the side, then whished up the lum, for nae mair would he bide. He louped to the sleigh. His team gave a whistle, and a they all flew like the dune o' a thristle. But I heard him cry out, or he drave out a sicht, a blithe yuletide to aw, and to aw a good nicht. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much.
what an incredible reading that was. Um, and I can see in the chat all the way through um, your talk for us today, people have been feeling um, so much positivity, uh, especially I think people really appreciated the multicultural um, aspect of the book and how um, Glasgow and the historic buildings are represented there. People are saying how much it reminds them of their time staying in Glasgow, how they remember the pineapple um, from times of before. So yeah, I think this is really chiming with, with our attendees today. So thank you so much, Irene. Very welcome. <laughs> um, so for everyone that this is affected today, um, we've got our first question coming in from Jeff, who's asking, um, he used to live in Edinburgh, but now he's based in the US. And mm -hmm. do you know of virtual or online courses that you could recommend? Um, yes, there are um, some. You think of anything, Gordon? There are. Yeah. I wonder if you could perhaps um, switch over to Ishbel there, because Ishbel maybe has no. more... <laughs> um, Dr. Ishbel, operator of PowerPoint, um, <laughs> you might be able to suggest some. I know on, on social media, you know, I do follow um, at Scott's, various Scott's things on social media. And, and there are, you know, there's frequently Scott's courses being advertised. I mean, Aberdeen University is actually running, um, starting to run a, a degree in Doric, the 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 dialect of Scots that is spoken widely in the northeast of Scotland. Um, but no, there are there are um, various things that can be done. Ishbel, have you anything you could add to that? Um, the Open University have online courses in Scots language that are partly run by Dr. Michael Dempster, who's been the Scots Screever uh, with the National Library of Scotland. And yeah, that um, Aberdeen University, the Elphinstone Institute is a good place to look at. That's their Scots language specialist. But there's also books. There's the Scots language learner book by uh, Lewis, the publisher, and that would take you through and you can you can do that in your own time as well. Fantastic. Thank you. And perhaps you could share with us a couple of links and maybe we could email that out to people. Mm -hmm. oh, we will. Yes. Wonderful. Fantastic. So our next question is from Joe, and this is a really interesting one. So who are the current Scottish celebrities who are champions of the Scots language and how may they be more encouraged to promote this language in literature and spoken word? Um, well, the, uh, there is a, a Scots language award um, um, every every year there's a Scots Language Awards now. It's a recent thing, but it's it's now become annual um, towards uh, later on in the year, um, and where awards are given for all sorts of different aspects of writing, publishing Scots, speaking Scots, and um, there are, I mean, the well last year the winner of the Scots Speaker of the Year, um, very well known to those of us who've been following her uh, her um, her little takeoffs of of Nicola Sturgeon's um, coronavirus briefings, but Janie Godley, the the Scottish um, comedian, she was um, given the Scots language. Um, speaker of the year at the awards last year so um janie has a, a very wide following um i mean obviously there's the elaine c smith who who wrote um the translations of um of one of the uh, hans christian anderson stories and um so there are you know there are a number of uh, different scottish um People that we just find in public life. There is in within Parliament. There's, um, I mean, they are obliged to support Scots in the Scottish Parliament. Um, the Scottish government is obliged to support Scots, and um, they have a member of the Scottish government who is has that as a particular responsibility. And of course, they do provide the the Scots language a publication award. Um, which uh, we were fortunate to get last year. But um, I think, I mean, there's, there are Miss Scots plays, there are Scottish actors performing in, in plays that are written in Scots. It's becoming more and more acceptable, I think. And if you follow social media at all, I mean, the amount of Scots that is used in uh, <clears throat> in social media now is, is huge. Um, people, <clears throat> not just necessarily in 
in broad Scots, but people mixing Scots and and the with the English, um, so it's it's become much more acceptable. So I think it's far more widely um, available now. Um, Scots uh, uh, to where you can you can pick up and read Scots and 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 hear Scots being spoken. I think than it was when I was involved with Scots Language Society originally, a way back in the in the late seventies. Um, I mean. Anybody wanting to, you know, to use or to write in Scots, you know, it's by all, you know, they should absolutely use the, the books that are, uh, the dictionaries that are available. Um, and these, you know, when I was doing my translation, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I couldn't really have managed it without this, the Scots, the concise Scots dictionary, the Scots thesaurus, um, the, the concise English Scots dictionary. I mean, these are all um, ways in which people you know, talking about people using Scots themselves, the ways that you can actually increase your your Scots um, Scots vocabulary and confidence in Scots. Um, but yeah, I think I don't know, Isabel. Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, it's good. Someone in someone in the chat saying Grab Wilson as well, um, who's a poet in Scots, and there's lots of lots of folk writing. A lot of celebrities that you know of Scots celebrities wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as Scots language speakers like Limmy for example but um, a lot of his work is in I would describe as Scots language so that's, a, that's an issue that Scots has um, or um, uh, Loki the rapper he raps in Scots but I don't know if he would identify as a Scots language speaker. Yeah, um, we will provide a link to the Scots Language Awards so that people, when they come up uh, later on in the year, whether it's online or 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 live, you know, to 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 find out about that because um, that that's a very um, that's that's been a great innovation and um, a great support for for Scots and for the status of Scots within the spoken spoken language. So. Um, any anything else that that's, well that's wonderful to hear that scots is becoming more and more prevalent in the public sphere and in popular yes. culture long may that continue um i'm conscious that we're starting to come to the end of our time so just one more question um what is next for you irene oh well yes well yeah i think uh, having done one one book um i'm you know i'm now thinking oh maybe i should have a go at another one i mean i want to to make more of this certainly want to make more of this one and pick up on opportunities that we didn't have last year because of the um, because of COVID, um, dratted COVID. And, uh, but with, to do more with the Nectar for Christmas this year, but um, I'm now looking at, you know, other things, either something else that I might translate or something that I might write from scratch. Um, it's, I mean, I'm constantly watching to see what else is being produced because I did have one idea, I won't, I won't share it, but I did have one idea of something I really thought, ah, this is gonna be great and I shall, I shall do this next to discover that somebody else is already doing it. <clears throat> and that's the thing, you've got to, you know, you've got to keep ahead of the game with this and uh, not just spend time thinking about it, but actually do it. But no, I do have a couple of other Scots, um, Scots book type things that I'm considering for, um, and maybe, hopefully, maybe if I do some more with the Nectar for Christmas this year, maybe get something going for next year. Obviously, having got the Scots Language um, Award, the grant, that was such a, a good thing. I, I don't, it would have been very difficult to have done this book um, at the cost that it, that it was without act, without that. So it would be nice to maybe apply for the grant again for something. But so that's about uh, about it, really. I haven't any, nothing definite to see at the moment. Well, fantastic. All the best of luck with that. And we look forward to seeing what is next. Huge thanks from me. And over to you, John, for our vote of thanks. Am I unmuted? Good, thank you. Um, I don't want to sound like Ebenezer Scrooge, but it takes hard work for me to get enthusiastic about Christmas when it's not even Lady Day. So what a tremendous achievement, the first Christmas celebration of the year, I think. Um, <laughs> you've given us a, a, an hour which has been fantastic for the inclusiveness, the multicultural aspect and the sheer love of detail that has gone into your book. 
But nothing in that prepared, I think, any of us for the reading, which was, I don't know what the Scots word is for this, but just utterly awesome. So that was fantastic, and fantastic also the collaboration between Irene and Ishmael in turning quite a demanding slot into a, an utterly flawless presentation. So I think it only remains for me to thank you both very much indeed, and thank you to Carrie for holding us all together, and uh, wish Irene luck with the next presentation, next production. Don't tell us yet what it is, but we shall be watching out. Didn't get yourself this jasket or fair fusionless. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Thank you.